So what I want to do right now is introduce Larry Davidson, who's the director of our program, and he's going to talk to us about the potential role of peer support in preventing suicide. Good morning. My, my real role is to introduce Michael Hogan, but before I do that, uh, I just want to say a few reasons about why this topic for the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And the, the simple answer is because it's tragic. And I want to start with the, the uh, suicide note that Virginia Woolf left for her husband. I feel certain that I am going mad again. I feel we can't go through another of those terrible times and I shan't recover this time. I begin to hear voices and I can't concentrate. So I'm doing what seems the best thing to do. You have given me the greatest possible happiness. You have been in every way all that anyone could be. I don't think two people could have been happier till this terrible disease came. I can't fight any longer. I know that I am spoiling your life, that without me you could work and you will, I know. You see, I can't even write this properly. I can't read. What I want to say is I owe all the happiness of my life to you. You have been entirely patient with me and incredibly good. I want to say that. Everybody knows it. If anybody could have saved me, it would have been you. Everything has gone from me but the certainty of your goodness. I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been. I have two points in, in starting with this. One is to remind us, if we need to be reminded, that suicide happens to people, people first and foremost, before we get to any explanations, any causes, any strategies for preventing it, we need to realize that this is what happens to people who are tragically feeling hopeless and helpless and lost, and who feel like they have no other option. So that's the first. The second is because there's really no explanation for this. These are other people who've died by suicide. Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade most recently, but Kurt Cobain, et cetera, people we've all heard of. <clears throat> but then there are people who maybe some of you haven't, well, Ernest Hemingway you've all heard of, but there, there are some people maybe you haven't heard, George Eastman of Eastman Kodak, a, a tycoon, billionaire, well, in those days a millionaire, had everything in the world you could possibly want, but ended up dying by suicide. Gilles Deleuze, the far right on the bottom, was probably the second or third most influential philosopher of the 20th century. Brilliant man, died by suicide. Larry Kohlberg, a very famous psychologist who established moral development as a worthy topic of investigation, died by suicide. These are very valuable, creative, brilliant people who for some reason couldn't live any longer. And these are the people we're here to try to, to keep from doing just that. So a few facts about suicide. The rates have increased by over 30% since 1999. Suicide rates are 10 times higher for people with behavioral health conditions than people who are, do not have behavioral health conditions. And approximately 5% of all people with major mood and psychotic disorders will die by suicide. We also know that risk following psychiatric hospitalization is 80 times higher than the national suicide rate and 150 times higher for those admitted for suicidal ideation and behavior or behaviors. So while not all people with mental health conditions die by suicide, having a mental health condition certainly does increase your risk and being in care may help, but it seems like transitions of care, which is one thing we're going to focus on, are times of high risk. We know that things that contribute to suicide are multiple. Suicide risk is fluid. It results from the complex interplay between stable vulnerabilities and dynamic properties that fluctuate with stressors and distress. Hopelessness is perhaps the most important risk factor. And treatment, engagement, and social connection are protective factors. Having other people in your life who care about you is very important. 
and depression is a very high risk factor. Among U.S. persons who died from suicide with a known mental health condition, 75% were diagnosed with depression. And among the 54% of people who died who did not have a known mental health condition, 33% appeared to have been depressed at the time of their death. I'm going to skip this. Why peer support? Why peer support? Well, for one reason, well, there's a number of reasons, but first of all, we, the first thing we did when we received this Mental Health Technology Transfer Center grant was to do an environmental scan of what was happening in New England and what the needs in New England were. And the first thing we discovered in relation to suicide is there was a lot of suicide prevention work already going on, and you, you probably know about this better than we do because we're just learning about this now. But one of the areas that did not seem to have been developed yet was that this could be a role for peers. And that's an area where we have particular expertise in our mental health TTC. So we figured if anybody in the country was going to look at the role of peers in preventing suicide, we were best positioned to do so. We also have the Western Massachusetts Learning Collaborative, who has a tremendous expertise in that area to build on. We also know that peers can produce at least equivalent outcomes when it comes to traditional outcomes, but in the area of recovery-oriented outcomes like increasing hope, empowerment, and engaging people in self-care, peers can be especially effective. We know that people often feel more open, accepted, and hopeful when working with peer supporters than with traditional providers. And we do know Paul Pfeiffer at the University of Michigan has been the first to try to deploy peer staff in preventing suicide, and it seems to have tremendous potential. So the model that we're working with is theoretical framework that we're having so far, this is where we're starting, is that the psychosocial factors most linked to suicide are loss of connections to others, a loss of a sense of self-worth, and a loss of hope. And these are areas that peers can be particularly effective in promoting community inclusion, in providing empathic support, which validates people's lived experience, and cultivating a sense of hope. So in closing for my introductory comments, we're hoping to develop a learning collaborative on preparing the lived experience workforce to target prevention of suicide during transitions. Initially, we're going to target adults. It's important that we state that up front. In the, ho in the future, we hope to be able to address children and youth as well, but we're starting with adults. And we're looking for partners, both in terms of expertise and leadership and agencies who deploy peers who want their peers to be trained in this, the approach that we will be developing with our partners. I now have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Hogan to you. He probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Dr. Hogan served as mental health commissioner in Connecticut, Ohio, and New York over a 25-year period and chaired the President's New Freedom Commission on Mental Health, which came out with its final report in 2003 under the Bush administration. That report has been crucial in establishing recovery as the overarching aim of all mental health services, and we have owe Dr. Hogan a tremendous amount of gratitude for shepherding that through the process, the federal process. In fact, today we're bringing together what I think are Dr. Hogan's two passions a recovery-oriented approach to preventing suicide, which is why he agreed to come and join us today, for which we're very appreciative. Since leaving New York State government in 2012, he's focused on working to make health care safe for suicidal people, an interest that began in Western Massachusetts mental health system almost 40 years ago, and I'm very much happy to be able to introduce him to you. I am uh, so appreciative of the opportunity to be with you because this, as Larry has said, and Larry, Larry you're, I, I'd like to take your remarks and show them to people that are deep into the suicide work because a lot of times they just like don't get it and what you said is what they, what they need to understand. Um, but I'll get a little bit more to what has brought me to, uh, 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 to this. Um, but this really is a confluence of these two strands and themes 
of um, the, the role of lived experience and of peer support uh, with suicide prevention. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first meeting like this. I mean, there have been little meetings, you know, people, a few people in a conference room, you know, the, the folks in Michigan or whatever. This is the first meeting that I know of that's a big deal with people from multiple states to explore this. And for the reasons that I'm gonna, that you already know and that I'm gonna describe, I think this is, um, uh, this is really profoundly important. And probably there's no place better that to uh, explore and expand uh, this, uh, this connection than, uh, than New England. So my commitment to these issues started about almost 40 years ago, as Larry, as Larry said, at a, uh, at a young age, I was actually 16 at the time, um, I was put in charge of mental health services in Western Massachusetts, which was kind of a joke because I didn't have a clue uh, what I was doing. But fortunately, there were a lot of people around who um, were generous with their time and uh, advice. And I can remember in particular, there were a couple of psychiatrists and some people with lived experience that uh, I ended up being able to sort of, I didn't have pers I didn't have like formal relationships with any of them, but I was able to sit down with them and, and pick their brain. And one of these individuals who was a kind of an inspiration, he was a guy who had been, you know, in and out of services, in and out of the hospital, in and out of community services, and was giving back the way a lot of people with lived experience do um, to offer connection and hope and inspiration to, um, to others. His name was Peter Daly. And Peter took his life. And, um, <clears throat> It was, you know, shocking, and it was painful the way a, a loss is of uh, somebody that you know, and it really uh, it opened up something for me that was kind of profound, which is this notion that because uh, I didn't understand much about suicide at that time, this notion of somebody who was, in some ways, a success story vis-a-vis -vis participation in mental health care, could be failed by the system in the worst way that it's possible for us to, uh, uh, to, to, to fail people. So the, the bug for me, in a sense, started then. And like then through you know, this career and 25 years of trying to run state mental health systems, <laughs> the, the, the last five or six of them were in New York, which convinced me to give up because <laughs> nobody could run it. Um, Th this issue was always there, and so I, as Larry said, I've, I've gravitated uh, uh, to it, and it's my, uh, it's my mission in, um, in semi-retirement. So this is a, just a quick tour through, trying to bring these two fields together in my own, uh, in my own peculiar way. The, w one of the points here, and I wanna speak, um, a lot of this is just about the work of suicide prevention. Um, I got frustrated with what was going on in suicide prevention when I was trying to run these systems for two fundamental reasons. One was that people were dying in our care. Lots of people were dying in care. You can't work in this field without experiencing this. And if you sit you know, at the top of a pyramid, stuff comes across your desks and the numbers are stunning and staggering. And so often at the end of the review, uh, it, it sort of comes down to, he seemed okay. Um, uh, we did what we were supposed to do, and a person is dead. And for me, a, a part of this mission is by my best calculation, in the 25 years that I was allegedly in charge of these three state systems, by my best estimation, 3,500 people that were in care in one of those systems died. So, the system that is supposed to, the system to which people are sent when they are quote unquote dangerous to themselves by reason of mental illness is failing at that mission. And the second thing that, excuse my French, uh, piss, pissed me off about this was that the field of suicide prevention seems to me also to have been failing. It was failing in two, in two ways. One is people were out there working on like training volunteers 
you know, to, to, and, and stuff like that, to identify people who are suicidal, um, the chance that the people that are trained would actually have an encounter with somebody that was suicidal is kind of slim to none. You know, but there's a whole cottage industry of doing that kind of, of training. And then in the deep end of the suicide pool, the, uh, the field known as suicidology, um, the, there's some really smart people that have done some really profound work, but a lot of that is so bizarro and off point that it offers us, um, offers us no guidance. So I'll, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. So the, this, let me just ask, how many people are, uh, how many of you consider yourself pretty conversant or involved in some, a zero suicide program? Okay, good. So uh, a number of you uh, uh, are, and some aren't, and some probably think they know what it is. So I'm going to sort of go through the, where, this, um, where, this, where this came from. I'd like to use this chart to illustrate the problem. This is uh, uh, death rates uh, from uh, suicide uh, and from heart disease. And you also see below the line there cancer, stroke, and all-cause mortality. Now, the, this data only goes up through 2013. The, the numbers essentially stay the same, but I, like, I, I, I'm limited in my ability to do graphs. And so it's a little bit outdated. But you can sort of see that um, it's kind of sort of working with respect to heart disease. And it's uh, not working, clearly, yet with respect to uh, a suicide. And so a, a, a first uh, question on this road to thinking about could we do better was to look at would healthcare settings be one good place to do better about suicide? Well, it turns out like big time because most people that are dying by suicide have had a relatively recent contact with a healthcare professional. I think the most shocking figure, there are a number here that are kind of shocking, but one that's actually not even on here is that 72% of old guys who die by suicide saw their GP in the 30 days before they died. That's according to Yates Conwell, who's a geriatric psychiatrist in, in Rochester. 72% in the month before they died. What are the odds that that's chance? What was going on, do we think? These people had pain of some kind physical, psychic, often both. Um, the, you know, old guys are less likely to go see a mental health person for a whole variety of reasons. So they go to the one healthcare professional they trust. They don't have the words to articulate this pain. And what doesn't happen? They don't get asked. And so they, they go there with the pain. They don't get any relief from the pain. and a. Um, a month later, they are, uh, they're dead. It's also sort of shocking to see that 15 to 25 percent of the people who died by suicide receive care in the state mental health system. Now, that's based on a few brave states that have actually done a data crosswalk. It might be an interesting project to, re to redo over time in New England, but a data crosswalk between people who got care, people who died. Um, that has uh, the, the the number in Vermont was about 25%. Kentucky was the first state to do it. It was uh, uh, 25%. The, this is a, a, like sort of a mental health policy uh, quiz. There's actually one state I know of where the, only 10% of the people who died um, were in the state mental health system, and that was Texas. W why do you think only 10% of the people that died were in getting care in the state mental health system? It's because, like, they don't really have a system and nobody can get in. So, so because nobody can get, anyway. The, we, we did a, a, a study in New York. It was not a data matching study. It was just incident reports that had come in of people that had died. And it was 13% uh, of all the people that died by suicide had gotten care in the public mental health system. Do 13% or 25% of the population get any care in the public mental health system? No, I mean, it's like two or three or maximum 4%. So 
So again, this, this point that the system that's supposed to be taking care of people is failing in this way. And so you see it in, in the bottom. I think that the places where uh, peer work uh, focused on this problem can be really impactful in, um, uh, in across the state mental health system in emergency departments. And the reason why my, my last number there has a different, you know, it's still shocking, but a different number than the one uh, Larry used. It was just a different study. This is an international study looking at rates of suicide uh, and finding this incredibly high risk, not before people get in the hospital, but after people get in the hospital. So th this, this frame that I introduced of, of how to make suicide care more like heart care, well, like for one thing, you have to do more. And I think a really uh, good example of that is the, just to compare, <laughs> the last time you were at the dock, did they check your blood pressure? Yeah, I mean, I, they, they always do that. Did they ask about suicide? Anybody? Two, three, four, five, six. So everybody gets their blood pressure checked. Almost nobody, and five years ago that would have been zero. So we're starting to make a little bit of progress. Even though, like here's a, a, a factoid for you. The answer to the question of whether you're thinking about suicide is far more predictive of whether you might die by suicide than blood pressure um, or high cholesterol are of dying by a heart attack. In other words, the way we can approach this, if we use the best of our knowledge, is actually better than cardiology. Um, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not mainstream yet. And then there's this question also. What is it that's made that death rate, not the total number of deaths, but the death rate go down from heart disease? Is it interventional cardiology, where people go into the hospital and get new, like, you know, and somebody opens them up and does a new valve? Like, uh, how much does interventional cardiology contribute to reduced rate of death? It turns out it does, but by my best calculation, it's about 10%. How about primary prevention? Because we'd really like to, primary prevention is the best way to do this. It turns out that primary prevention is really relevant with respect to heart disease in one way in particular. It's not like eat spinach, lose weight, and exercise more, because we're supposed to do those things, but we don't. But the one thing that's really made a difference is smoking. And so a reduction in smoking has done for heart disease what a reduction in trauma would do for suicide. But smoking is easier than trauma. And it's also easier for our country for lots of different reasons to try to attack uh, smoking than it is to attack, uh, attack trauma. So it turns out what has really reduced uh, the death rate in the last 20 years or so for heart disease is targeted preventive interventions. This is like jargony stuff, but hang with me. For people that have risk. Um, well, what do we mean by a targeted preventive intervention? For heart attacks, it's statins and ACE inhibitors. So basically, get that blood pressure down and get the, the bad cholesterol down. So these are interventions for people that have these risk factors, um, and they are quite effective. It turns out they're not effective as good suicide care is in preventing suicide, um, but they're quite, they're quite effective. So what has worked with heart disease is targeting, first of all. It's not wandering around and trying to do something with everybody, and it's not staying in the hospital because it's preventive. Um, but so targeted preventive interventions are what has worked. So that Larry had this slide too. I'm going to like do it very quickly. This is the the cracks that people fall through to die by suicide. Um, like you, you hear that term used? They fell through the cracks. Well, they people do fall through cracks. It, it's we use a Swiss cheese metaphor because it's like a, a recognized way of looking at safety. Um, developed by this guy, James Reason. And these are the cracks that people fall through. Our failure to ask them what's going on. If they acknowledge thoughts of suicide, the big crack there is we, we don't lean in 
and have a conversation that works on a relationship, we lean back and call for the psychiatrist or you know, say go to the, you know, go to the emergency department, um, which is uh, not a good way to respond. So what we should be doing is leaning in, support, sympathy, engagement, and then helping the person develop their own plan, not our plan, their own plan for, um, for safety and, and recovery. The single most potent thing we can do actually turns out to be to identify if people are thinking about suicide, the way they have thought about doing it. What means have they thought about and engaging in that directly? Oh, so you, you have a gun, you're gonna use your gun. Is anybody at home right now? Would, would it be okay if we called home and had that gun put in a safe place until you felt better? Um, so in, we're starting to have some real empirical data on this, but all the common sense data suggests that that personal means restriction is really uh, is really critical. Um, directly treating suicidality, so here's a question. Probably about half of all people that are admitted to inpatient are there because you know, they're dangerous to themselves, themselves by reason of mental illness. When they get in the hospital, does their suicidality get treated? No. I mean, unless the hospital is really progressive and it's starting to work directly on that, and some are. But mostly, it's not. You get started on meds to deal with the mental health diagnosis, uh, and you pretty quickly learn that the only way to get out is to deny suicidality, so you deny it. And after you've denied it you know, strongly and repeatedly and convincingly, you can get out. But the meds you got started on, first of all, you know, they haven't even stabilized the symptoms of, the, of this other kind of problem, and you get out at increased risk. So this is kind of irritating. You know, the, the, this is the only situation that I know of where when you get admitted to the hospital, you don't get treated for the, th you don't get the thing treated that got you in. We talk about a need for a lived experience and, a, and peer support. And finally, supports when it's needed, because Larry's exactly right. The things that are really bad, if you're in this space of thinking about ending your life, and you can see it in the, in the, um, uh, in the, in the, the, the quote at the, at the very beginning, the thing, isolation is poison. And losing hope is like the flame. And then there's the means you have. So if we directly at attack the, the isolation by just human contact, if we directly attack hope by amplifying it, if we give people tools to help themselves uh, be in a process of recovery and, and safety. That's what really works. So it's these things that together make up this uh, zero suicide um, um, approach. I don't really have time to go through all this, but th these are the, on the left-hand side, uh, the, in a sense, the active ingredients of, of a zero suicide. And it like, turns out that in individual studies, all these things are, are, are effective. Um, And th this is just one data. The first people to actually r do this was even before we had this term zero suicide with the Henry Ford Health System. This was in their mental health program at Henry Ford. So, and this is the suicide rate at the beginning and their suicide rate after, uh, after a couple of years. Basically what they, what they did, and it, it's not perfect, but they reduced the rate of suicide among people with mental illness from the terribly elevated rate that it is to about the rate of the general population. Um, and, and the same thing has been done at these other places that uh, have implemented this approach. Now the, the, the kicker here and the, the reason for the importance of this meeting and my high hopes for what you're able to develop together here is uh, the connection between uh, peer roles and uh, lived experience with suicide prevention. As, as Larry already said, the things that are the most critical and effective in preventing suicide are precisely the kind of things that uh, peers who are equipped for this work, and you know, the fact that you're or somebody else is a peer specialist doesn't necessarily mean they're comfortable with suicide. So I'm really talking about experience in that place as being the really, uh, uh, the, the really critical thing. Providing hope, providing human contact, um, 
and um, helping people with uh, the skills uh, to, to uh, prevent um, uh, desperate action. So for example, in, a, in developing a safety plan, some people and with lived experience don't like the term safety plan because it, you know, it's somebody else's agenda. It's not really necessarily my, I'm more interested in living a good life and recovery, but the it's safety plan is what it's called. So a good example of that would be, um, well, the next time you feel like this, um, have you ever tried calling the suicide prevention lifeline? Well, so the, here's their number. You have your phone. I'm gonna step out of the room. Why don't you try calling them up and seeing how that is? And uh, it might work for you, it might not work for you. If it does work for you, the number's in your phone. And the next time you feel like that, you could call them. Um, so uh, just uh, an, a, a perfect example of a support kind of role. And the, the other thing that many of you know from personal experience is that usual care, a phrase I hate, Usual care is often worst for people who are experiencing suicidal intensity, uh, which is a, uh, a, a term from Eduardo Vega, who uh, has had his own experiences in this space. And lived experience perspectives can repair that. Um, you know, so what we tend to do is we're afraid, so we contain people. We contain them in the ED. We actually contain them in the hospital because we're not really directly treating the thing that got him admitted. And since the impulse to die by suicide is often fleeting, that impulse will pass. You know, so in a sense, you can say containment works. But then if you look at the high rates just after discharge, it's like containment is not a, not a good strategy. You know, overuse of inpatient care, meds only treatment. There's essentially no data. I'm exaggerating a tiny bit. There's a little bit of data that Clozaril is protective of suicide specifically for people with psychotic experiences. That's essentially it in terms of data about medication treating suicidality. Medication might help with respect to the mental health problem. It doesn't help with respect to the psychic problem. So in order to, um, uh, to do this, we got to get better at, at, at providing suicide care. We, we're just at the very beginning of starting to do that well, and then building in peer roles every place. Um, I was just sort of thinking about this. Judy Chamberlain's book on our own was 1978. That's how many years ago? 40, 41 years ago. The American Association of Suicidology established a lived experience division. When do you think that was? It was three years ago. So this, you know, the, the, the energy, the knowledge that is with lived experience really needs to be um, applied. And this is, this is just some of the settings that it seems to me the, this work can be, can be done in. And I know that the folks in Western Mass have already partnered with the D.D. Hirsch folks from L.A. Uh, to be doing support groups, haven't? Yeah, they, they insist on a therapist and uh, so you're doing it, all right. So you're already engaged in, uh, so uh, support, support groups run by people with lived experience for people that are in the middle of, of uh, or ha experience suicide intensity. I put in this thing, it's, this is a little bit gratuitous, but uh, on, on uh, peer warm lines, I put in Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners, which is a statewide uh, hotline in, uh, in Colorado, but one of the things they do is when a, when, a, when a call comes in, the initial calls get answered by professionals. But if it's not a thing that like requires a professional to make an immediate thing, they flip the line over to a warm line. And my son started working there a month ago. <clears throat> that's another really big deal for me. So the, that's an, another role for, uh, uh, for peer um, support and then the peer operated respite programs that have started to spring up around the country. So this is not a comprehensive list, but a, um, um, but, but a beginning list. And so this is my last slide, which I always end with for several uh, reasons. The, the, the analogy between like healthcare safety, which is horrible, and airline safety doesn't look quite as good as it looked a couple of years ago um, with uh, the, the, the problems that we've had with that uh, max eight or whatever it is. But still, 
Those planes haven't crashed in the United States. Health, uh, airlines, safe, airlines are safer than hospitals. Um, and um, and the, the, the reason why they're safer is illustrated by the, the movie Sully, if you saw that, so the, you know, Sullenberger and his, so they land the plane on the Hudson, everybody lives, the, all the regulators think that was the wrong thing to do, we should have turned back, and he demonstrates that human beings couldn't make that decision that quickly, and if you look at the way human beings act, what they did was the safest thing that could be done, and finally, at the end, after they've got done grilling him, the NTSB interrogator says to him, essentially, I know you, we've given you a really hard time, Captain Sullenberger, but you're a hero. And the key thing about that for me is not that statement, it's his response. His response is, I am not a hero. I just did my job. And the co-pilot was great. And the flight attendants did exactly what they were supposed to do. And the passengers were wonderful, and the first responders were, you know, off the charts. Everybody just did their job, that's why we're safe. And so, you know, now everybody needs to do their job with respect to suicide prevention, but we have to redefine that by focusing on uh, suicide prevention in a way that's gonna be helpful. And the best, one of the best ways to do that is gonna be uh, engagement of people with lived experience at every level in that process. So I end where I started, which is to say thank you for being here, for the work you do. And for this meeting, which is the first time that I'm aware of in the country that people have come together for this kind of uh, a dialogue. So I hope that something begins and starts to spread uh, and spreads across the rest of the country. Thanks.